think of when you think of the Muslim woman? Do you think of the hijab? Do you think of the burqa? Do you think that the Muslim woman is submissive? And do you think she's oppressed? These are the common stereotypes that you think of, that a lot of people think of when they think of Muslim women. Now, why is a Muslim woman identified by the hijab or the burqa? Because that's what you see in the media all the time. But if going by numbers, here's a fact. Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world with 250 million people, almost 90% of whom are Muslim. So if you go by numbers, really, the typical Muslim woman should look like this. Like that. No hijab, no burqa. However, where did this hijab come from? Where did this hijab come from? It actually comes from the Middle East. It is a response to the environment. Like all of us, when we're hot, we wear a certain type of clothes. When we're cold, we wear a certain type of clothes. And in the Middle East, they wear it because it is hot, it is dusty, it is sandy. You need protection from all that. So you see in the Middle East women who dress like this or like this. But guess what? The men too cover up. So it's not just the women who are all covered from head to toe. And women's head coverings actually, especially in the Middle East, are not confined to Muslim women. All sorts of women cover their heads for religious reasons and for other reasons. And here's a whole spectrum of them from the Middle East, from Asia, from everywhere else. It's really not something unique to Muslim women. Now, where did the burqa come from? Well, it's definitely not from the Quran, because the Quran does not mention the burqa, it doesn't talk about covering your face. It is, I think, a very cultural thing that comes from certain countries like Afghanistan, etc., where the whole thing is covered up. Um, it, must be also have or, it must also have originated from the environment. And sometimes it, you can understand it. I've been to Mecca, for instance, and it's so bright, it's so glary that I can understand how once upon a time in the 6th century when people didn't have sunglasses, you would wear something over your eyes in order to cut off the glare. So that may be where it originated from. Now, nowadays, Muslim women wear the hijab in different ways because they now have choices. So you don't just see that all black thing. Nowadays, you see this type of uh, hijabsters, they call them hijabsters, Yuna Zarai. Yuna Zarai is a well-known singer, Malaysian singer, who's doing very well uh, overseas in the US. Uh, Ms. Nina is a rapper, also Malaysian. And this is Raja Nadia Sabrina, who is a Malaysian fashion blogger with over 100,000 followers. But why is the hijab so identified uh, with Muslim women? Sorry, it should be identified. Um, a lot of people point to this verse in the Quran, 2431. And especially the first part. And it says, And tell the believing women to lower their gaze and to be mindful of their chastity and not to display their charms in public beyond what may decently be apparent thereof. Hence, let them draw their head coverings over their bosoms. Now, people who started thinking really about this verse have pointed out something. If the instruction is to let them draw their head coverings, the head coverings must have already existed. So it wasn't something that was unusual at the time. It was already there and therefore was not invented uh, by Islam. And secondly, it says, let them draw their head coverings over their bosoms. That seems to be the real instruction. Pull it down over your bosoms. And in fact, the word hijab does not appear in Arabic uh, in this verse at all. The word is kimar, which means the head covering. So where this word hijab comes in, in this context, talking about women covering their heads, um, is an invention, a human invention. 
the word hijab does appear in the Quran, but it means barrier. It means to put a barrier between yourself and others for privacy or something like that. But it's got nothing to do with your head covering. But the interesting thing also is that when this is cited uh, as the law or the rule for Muslim women to cover their heads in order to protect them from harassment and whatever, I've seen some really weird uh, analogies used that you know women are like candy that should be wrapped in the wrapper otherwise if you open it up they'll be surrounded by flies uh, <laughs> i don't think that's very nice about men um, but it's funny how people talk about this verse and use it as their excuse uh, to say that this is how a muslim woman should be she should cover her head they very often neglect to look at the verse preceding it, 2430, which says this, tell the believing men to lower their gaze and to be mindful of their chastity. This will be most conducive to their purity. And so it's not about blaming women for what happens to them because of the way they dress. It's telling men first to mind yourself mind your manners, be respectful, lower your gaze. So, does the hijab mean Muslim women are submissive? Well, here's a great example of a woman in a hijab who is not. Uh, Ibti Haj Muhammad is a Muslim American woman who is a fencer, and one of the best fencers uh, in the world. And wearing the hijab has certainly not stopped her at all uh, from uh, pursuing this quite aggressive sport, as far as I know, but fencing. And here are some other Muslim women, all in hijab, who I think you might recognize, and I, I wouldn't call any of them particularly submissive. I'd just like to point out two of them. The woman in pink in the middle at the top is Malaysian. I don't know whether you've been reading the papers, her name is Dato Vida. She has a cosmetics company called uh, uh, Vida Cosmetics, which is doing extremely well. She's made a lot of money. And recently, she decided that she would sponsor the Kelantan football team uh, with 20 million ringgit, which is a lot of money, especially because the team wasn't doing so well, uh, with two conditions. One is that uh, the team has to wear t-shirts in her favorite color, which is that pink, and uh, that they had to paint their stadium pink, too. So I wouldn't call that submissive by any means. Um, the other woman I'd like to point out uh, is the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, you see a woman in a burqa. Uh, her name is Giselle Maria Rocha. She's from Brazil. She's uh, a Brazilian Muslim. Uh, she wears a burqa, and she's a heavy metal guitarist. Uh, which is, again, again, I think, if you know metal music is not at all uh, meek and quiet, uh, you can watch her on YouTube, and she's quite something. And the rest you might know, uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner, Tawaka Koma, Malala, of course you know, and two uh, women who were in the Bahraini and Saudi uh, Olympic teams, uh, most recently, and the first women to be in them. So are Muslim women oppressed? Well, if you look at the history of Islam, it uh, cannot be so, uh, because Islam brought a lot of rights to women. They, uh, it stopped the killing of baby girls. It gave women rights to property. It gave women the right to choose their own husbands. And the finest example we have is the very first Muslim who happened to be a woman, and that was the prophet's wife, Khatija. Khatija was a businesswoman, and in fact, she was Prophet Muhammad's boss. She employed him. She was very impressed by him, and so she proposed marriage to him. And uh, he couldn't really say no to his boss. Um, <laughs> But uh, anyway, they had a very, very happy marriage for 25 years, and she was his number one uh, emotional and financial supporter. 
uh, and he really, really relied on her very much uh, in his work in spreading this message of Islam. And 25 years later, when she died, um, he married again. And he married, um, not her, uh, this is a current young woman, he married uh, several other wives um, who were actually, uh, um, their marriages were done for political alliances because in those days, that was how people uh, made peace uh, with dif between different tribes by marrying each other uh, and all that. And, um, but the interesting thing was that all these, all these women that he married, and there were 10 altogether, um, they were not overawed by the, that, by the fact that they were married to this very special man known as the messenger of peace. In fact, uh, the prophet's wives used to argue with him. They, they were older women, very few of them were young, uh, you know, model types that people take as other wives, but um, they argued with him and he would take it in his stride. Um, he has never, never been known to hit any of his wives. He was never aggressive with them. And he used to do the housework as well. So this man in the 6th century was actually very much a 21st century husband. Um, but today it is true, uh, many Muslim women are oppressed. Not, I wouldn't say all of us, but many Muslim women are oppressed. And why is that? Uh, not because of their religion, as I have pointed out, uh, but because of poverty, uh, poverty and illiteracy. Uh, many uh, Muslim women, unfortunately, lived in very poor countries where the level of literacy is very, very low, uh, partly because of poverty and sometimes because people just want to keep it that way. Uh, the Republic of uh, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, for instance, has one of the lowest literacy rates in the world, only 58% for its whole population. And out of that, only 47% of the women are literate, compared to 70% of the men. So if you can't read and write, your opportunities are very limited, and therefore you're very vulnerable to being uh, oppressed and suppressed. And, and you can see with what happened with Malala, uh, what, um, what type of um, uh, opposition there is to education to women. Um, and I don't know why that picture came up. Actually, the other reason is violence and conflict. You've been reading about um, uh, the problems in Iraq, in Syria. Women are at the front line of that. They are being... Um, being raped sometimes, killed, being displaced from their homes. And even in the refugee camps where a lot of displaced people are at, women are facing violence there. And that keeps them uh, down. And last but not least is really uh, the interpretations of the Quran. The Quran came down in the, in the sixth century uh, as a revelation to the prophet. It was not collected. Um, as a book until many, many years uh, uh, after he died. And then it was left to a lot of people to interpret what is in the Quran. Some of it is very clear. Uh, some of it is not at all clear. Well, the thing was, most of the interpreters of the Quran have been men. And therefore, they have looked at it from their own particular perspective, and that's made sometimes life difficult for a lot of women. And that example of uh, verse 2431 is just one of them. So women are fighting back. I think I'm missing that. Um, women are fighting back by becoming educated, uh, despite the low literacy rates. Wherever women, Muslim women have had the opportunity to be educated, they have really taken it. And... Um, try to learn as much as possible. And in countries like, say, in Malaysia, women now outnumber uh, men in the universities. Um, now we have 70% of our university uh, students uh, female. And that makes a real difference because with education, they are learning about their rights and um, they are able to then fight back. 
Uh, challenging norms, uh, there are several women's organizations which are really challenging uh, what has been interpreted all these years. I belong to two of them, Sisters in Islam and Musawa. Uh, we are looking at reinterpreting some of the accepted ideas about how women should be in Islam and promoting these ideas because we believe that the essential um, uh, message of Islam is justice and equality. So we fight for justice and equality. And this shows women in the Arab uprising. There were a lot of women out there in the front line fighting for freedom and justice. Are we challenging media stereotypes of Muslim women? Because that's really essential. This is Kamala Khan, which is Marvel Comics' uh, first uh, Muslim woman uh, superhero. Uh, there are also other ways here in Malaysia. I've been co-producing a TV program for young women called 3R, Respect, Relax and Respond uh, for, three years, uh, for 10 years, which gives different ideas to young women on how to, um, what they can do with their lives, their rights, etc. And now we're going digital. We have a, t a TV channel online called Fee4TV, which is producing content that challenges a lot of the norms. And by taking the lead, this is Hadia Tajik. She's the first uh, Muslim, first Asian minister uh, and youngest minister in Norway. She is also a deputy head of the Labour Party, and she is slated to be the first uh, to be the next prime minister of Norway. So imagine that a Muslim woman being the leader of Norway. So, stereotypes do need to be fixed. Uh, they are problematic because they're unreal. They have nothing to do with the realities of Muslim women today. And we need to be mindful. We need to learn more because it's unfair to them. And I think also unfair to yourselves if you're operating without this, um, with these stereotypes. And by the way, I don't wear a hijab. I'm a Muslim woman, so don't stereotype me either. Thank you very much.